don't know what the metaverse is, that's okay. Today, we're gonna talk about the metaverse. Facebook meta outrage. Well, for Facebook, will meta make everything better? That was so much time in avatar meetings. My eyes hurt and my head hurts. The rebranding itself meta. And we call this the metaverse. Ah, the metaverse. What is it? When Mark Zuckerberg changed Facebook's name to Meta in October 2021, he was making a bet that Facebook's corner of the metaverse, an integrated virtual reality and mixed or augmented reality universe connected to through virtual reality headsets, would become the dominant metaverse platform. The concept itself is quite simple. A virtual, interconnected universe of apps, games, social networks, work tools, and exercise programs. In other words, a second virtual world. Which is where the prefix meta comes in, meaning above, beyond, or transcending. And actually, I think looking more closely at this term, meta, can tell us a bit more about what's going on in Zuckerberg's head. So let's look a bit closer. What does meta mean? Well, a meta rule is a rule governing all other rules, like the idea of majority rule to pass new rules. Metaphysics is the study of the very first principles of things like being, identity, free will, and the universe. The study of time and space, or the question of what it really means to be a person, and meta-narratives are stories that lie at the foundations of many other stories, like the hero's journey. So what does this mean when used in Metaverse? When you buy a Facebook Oculus Quest headset, you can log in to their Metaverse. They have different apps or areas like Horizon Home, quote, a home base in the Metaverse, where you can, quote, invite friends, can hang out, watch videos, and jump into games and apps together. This connects to Horizon Worlds, Horizon Workrooms, and venues for concerts, sports, and probably clan meetings, I'd imagine, knowing Facebook at some point. Facebook Messenger is connected, as of course are games. There's a fitness section and some kind of studio. There are also tools for developers to create really cool looking apps like this. A lot of these apps, frankly, look really fun, innovative and creative and exciting. But I'm more interested, again, in the meta part and the robot man who wants to build an actual universe. Let's go back to meta. Again, the meta part means above, beyond or transcending our own physical world. And the code, the algorithm, the system, like the rules that govern our own physical universe, which, let's face it, is famously cold, too spread out and full of <laughs> will be written and controlled by, in this case, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Crucially, the meta part while on one level just meaning a second universe, also means the digital infrastructure that third-party apps, news stories, and of course, you, will slot into. But to think more clearly about this, we can turn to the philosopher who wrote about meta-narratives in the 1970s and look at some of the ways he predicted this moment. Jean-Francois Lyotard. Tard? Tard? Tard. He was French. Lyotard was a French philosopher who wrote about many subjects, but is most famous for his 1979 book, The Postmodern Condition, a report on knowledge. He wanted to understand the condition of knowledge as a concept in the late 70s, as a post-industrial society, that is an information age, was beginning to emerge. He believed Western society was experiencing a crisis of narratives that were altering what he called the rules of the game for science, literature, and the arts. In fact, pretty much everything. Modern knowledge, he thought, up until then, had been part of a grand narrative that legitimated it, 
legitimated for him meant justifying, asking the question, what is this knowledge for? Answers were usually grand or meta. For example, we were getting to the root of all meaning, finding out exactly how language works, or moving towards the development of full rationality, finding out how to get into heaven, or emancipating the impoverished subject, creating utopias here on earth. He thought that people had believed these things throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, but that that was beginning to change somehow. Famously, he quipped that simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as an incredulity towards meta narratives. So, what is a meta narrative? Leotard points out that certain stories we tell ourselves have great themes, great heroes, great dangers, great voyages, a great goal. They have sweeping global and universal consequences. He calls them grand narratives or meta narratives. The biblical stories were about the historical and celestial sweep of human salvation, but so, in many ways, were the stories Marxists told themselves about the emancipation of the working class, or the story many Enlightenment liberals told about the incremental march towards perfect reason and liberty. Some dreamt of scientific utopias, others of empires stretching across the globe, or the divine right of kings to rule. Whatever the meta-narrative was, it legitimated and justified other things, other actions, ideas and beliefs, ways of living, and they were passed down from generation to generation by custom and formula. As the modern period advanced though, there was one meta-narrative that dominated above all others. Science. Leotard was prescient. He noticed in the 70s that, quote, the miniaturization and commercialization of machines is already changing the way in which learning is acquired, classified, made available, and exploited. He also said that knowledge is and will be produced in order to be sold. It is and will be consumed in order to be valorized in a new production. In both cases, the goal is exchange. He called it the computerization of society and realized that a lot of the developments in science and technology were to do with language, communications and cybernetics, modern algebra, computer languages, memory banks, telematics, AI, all supplemented with vast banks of data. The problem, he argued, is that scientific knowledge and data aren't enough. They have to be justified by some reference to a wider story, a wider narrative about what to do, how to act, what ethics and justice are, what purpose they serve, what we're doing politically, emotionally, how we live our day-to-day -day lives. But despite this, many people see science as self-justifying, as not needing a narrative for a meta-story. But there was always some kind of story underpinning it. Science, tacitly, was justified, funded and focused on because it led to greater freedoms, pointing people down the path of progress, or as the rector of the University of Berlin, Wilhelm von Humboldt had put it, because it supports the spiritual and moral training of the nation. In other words, the justifications for scientific knowledge, quote, lie outside the realm of scientific knowledge. When a scientist asks their boss for funding, the boss might reply, we'll have to see. Tell me your story. Why do you think this is important? And there were many questions. Was it just? Was it ethical? Was it in keeping with the national character? Should we be doing this? Who should be doing this? The problem was, as he saw it, that the stories, the meta-stories, religion, truth, progress, reason, economic development, emancipation, were themselves being questioned. They were no longer taken for granted. So what does this have to do with Mark Zuckerberg? I started Facebook. 
I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. All social media platforms have a meta-narrative underpinning them. The employees of Facebook have to tell themselves stories every day about what they're doing, how they're living their lives. And like telling a story, they have to decide which post, which tweet, which news item, photo, video or advert to show you next. They guide the conversation you have with your platform. And the algorithm, of course, is trying to get you to spend as much time on the platform as possible. Their goal is this, that the next thing in the feed in front of you conforms as precisely as possible to what your desire to see is in that moment. If it gives you precisely what you want to see, you stay on that platform longer. And of course, advertisers are motivated by this same logic too. They want to align their product with your desires. As well as serving you what you want, Facebook wants you to be served and to click on the most profitable ads. The ones that pay the most have the largest pockets. So their interest is not in serving you exactly what you want, nor in serving exactly what the advertiser wants but in serving a feed where your desires, addictions, biases, joys, both good and bad, are somehow merged with the desires of the advertiser, serve the desires of the capital that keeps the platform running. And as we'll see, there's a lot more that goes into this. And the obvious question is whether we want Mark Zuckerberg defining the meta-narrative of the entire meta First. The Facebook papers are more than 10,000 documents downloaded by an internal whistleblower at Facebook. We're learning more about the inner workings of Facebook, revealed in a massive collection of leaked documents. And presentations, and altogether they suggest that Facebook knew its platforms, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, can fuel hate, polarization, conspiracy theories, and misinformation. Between, do you want to reduce harmful content, do you want to reduce people's time on the platform? You choose keeping people's time on the platform. In October 2021, the Facebook papers, thousands of documents leaked by former employee Francis Haugen, revealed that time and again, Facebook discovered deep-rooted problems in their algorithm that it went on to either ignore or worse, perpetuate. Vox wrote that Facebook is distracting from the problems it creates or contributes to in the real world. Issues like harming teens' mental health, facilitating the spread of disinformation and fueling political polarisation. The documents show just how many decisions are made at Facebook, not by an algorithm, but by actual people at the company, behind closed doors, telling themselves stories motivated by profit that ultimately, and I think terrifyingly, affect all of our lives. To take just a few examples, last year Zuckerberg testified before Congress that Facebook removes 94% of hate speech on the site, while the leaked documents reveal that internal researchers estimated that the number was closer to 5%. I mean, is that not perjury? Another revelation was that the developers gave the angry response emoji a five times greater weighting in the algorithm than the like response because anger kept Facebook users engaged longer. That means if four of your friends liked a post and one of them angry responded to a post, the algorithm would show you the angry one. Facebook also regularly makes decisions that have global geopolitical implications. For example, Zuckerberg personally made the decision to block the account of a teacher in Vietnam who had been critical of the Vietnamese government, leading to the teacher's arrest and several deaths in a raid. And during the Stop the Steal protest, when Trump supporters stormed the Capitol in Washington, the papers revealed Facebook had a capital protest break the glass response, with levers set up ready to demote certain content and freeze comments in certain groups. Now, whatever you think of any one of these cases individually, does 
anyone out there really think that Mark Zuckerberg lording over literal levers like he's playing some real life version of SimCity is a good idea. What's been seen over the history of monopolistic, closed door, secretive institutions is that without checks and balances, democratization and transparency, those hovering over those levers often get greedy, naive and arrogant, or just slip up, pulling the wrong lever and accidentally, well, game over. And I'm not sure we want a game over on an entire universe. And if that wasn't enough, even Meta employees are concerned. One asked in an online meeting, how could we avoid a dystopian reality where the metaverse is used as an opium for the masses? And that's before we even get to the privacy problems that come with the expansion of data collection into the metaverse. Already having access to a trove of user data that has no precedent in history, Virtual reality will give Zuckerberg data on finger movements, facial patterns, the layout of our homes, data from virtual work meetings and fitness apps and so on. This is terrifying. And in fact, only 50% of Facebook's own employees think the company is making the world a better place. Haugen said that, I genuinely fear that a huge number of people are going to die in the next 5 to 10 years or 20 years because of choices and underfunding by Facebook. OK, let's return to Leotard. Why does he think that people have become incredulous towards meta-narratives in the postmodern era? And how can this help us think about what we should do about the metaverse? Leotard points towards new postmodern sciences emerging in the post-war period as an example of why meta-narratives are being met with scepticism. He writes, Postmodern science, by concerning itself with such things as undecidables, the limits of precise control, conflicts characterised by incomplete information, fracture, catastrophes and pragmatic paradoxes is theorizing its own evolution as discontinuous, catastrophic, non-rectifiable and paradoxical. It's changing the meaning of the word knowledge while expressing how such a change can take place. He's talking about things like chaos theory and quantum mechanics that have undecidability built into them. This, he argues, is a more accurate representation of the postmodern condition. We can no longer represent the world fully truthfully, accurately, universally, unequivocally. There are different positions and values everywhere, and so no one, not even scientists, can have a monopoly on the truth. In other words, even if we replaced Mark Zuckerberg with the wisest, most benevolent philosopher king, they'd have no more legitimacy in deciding how the algorithm should function than any of the rest of us. For Leotard, the postmodern condition is not about universal consensus, but about dissensus, friction, resistance and struggles between incommensurable positions. The problem is that when it comes to a corporation like Meta, the guiding principle, ultimately, has to be shareholder value and closed door decision making. The only guiding principle is engagement and capital. Values go out the metaverse spaceship window. In a quote that we can easily imagine being applied to the Facebook newsfeed, Leotard writes that today, capital is the degree zero of contemporary general culture. One listens to reggae, watches a western, eats McDonald's food for lunch and local cuisine for dinner, wears Paris perfume in Tokyo and retro clothes in Hong Kong. Knowledge is a matter for TV games. It's easy to find a public for eclectic works. By becoming kitsch, art panders to the confusion which reigns in the taste of the patrons. Artists, gallery owners, critics and public wallow together in the anything goes. So what can we do about this? Well, to paraphrase Leotard again, to have one metaverse is to assume that 
it's possible for all speakers to come to agreement on which rules or meta prescriptions are universally valid. This is not the case. We should all want to contribute to how we use these platforms. We should, as Leotard writes, favour a multiplicity of finite meta arguments. As he presciently wrote, increasingly the central question is becoming who will have access to the information these machines must have in storage to guarantee that the right decisions are made. What does this mean in practice? As media scholar Ethan Zuckerman has argued, we should learn from the way the UK and US treated early radio and television as public goods. In the UK, the BBC was created to provide a regulated public service, independent from direct government control. Even the free market US realised that it was necessary to have public television that wasn't run for profit, but driven instead by a set of values. Today, PBS and NPR are the most trusted media brands in the US, according to polls. Wikimedia, for example, the parent company of Wikipedia, runs on similar principles. They don't track users, sell data, and are run entirely on donations, proving that a different model is possible. We should, as Zuckerman argues, approach internet platforms in the same way. We could levy taxes on Google and Facebook to provide funding, or pass a digital ad tax to support the creation of an experimental public service social network that's not run on principles that are addictive, divisive, or subvert democracy. We could support open source alternatives where users could contribute to decisions about how the algorithm functions. In the Netherlands, for example, a group called Public Spaces advocates allocating funds for open source alternatives to US tech giants. I think the key to the postmodern period is contribution, openness, real democracy. The robber barons of the 19th century created huge exploitative monopolies in infrastructure, oil, industry that were ultimately broken up and regulated because of the clear danger they represented to democracy. And that was over a hundred years ago. If we don't do the same with social media corporations, we're in real danger of going backwards and worse. No single organization or person should have control over the meta-narrative. In democracies, we all deliberate and decide Together, we all, as Leotard said, have mini-narratives of our own to contribute. Thank you, as always, for watching. And a huge thanks, of course, as always, to my Patreons, without which this just wouldn't be possible. So if you want to see scripts, if you want to chat in the Discord server, if you want your name in the credits, but most of all, if you just want to help support make this content, then click the link in the description below. If not, you can like, you can share, you can leave a comment, all those things that help the algorithm. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.